you know about uh, the passing of uh, Rabbi Goldberg, so I would want to the learning to be Lehu and Um happens to be about Moshe Rabbeinu, so Moshe, Moshe Association. Um, Moshe Tzvi ben Yitzchak Halevi. Okay, so we're talking about Moshe and the the construction of the completion of the construction of the Mishkan. Take a look, please, at source number one from Pekude. People say you can't find the Dvar Torah on Pekude. It's not true. There's a lot to say on, uh, on Parshish Pekude. So, Vayim B'chodesh HaRishon, Bashana HaShiniz B'achal HaChodesh. It is the first month. It is the first month of the second year. In other words, the Jews have now been in the Midbar for a, uh, almost a full year. It is the first of the month, the first of Nisan, so it's one year since HaChodesh HaZelachem. Who come HaMishkan, the Mishkan is put up. Vayakim Moshe as HaMishkan. So Moshe puts up the Mishkan. Vayitainas Adonav. He puts, he puts the Adanim in, in place. Everyone who uh, you know, learned Vayakil and made it through Vayakil knows already what Adanim are. Um, those who decided that they're going to start Maver said, we like say Vayikra. Oh, I wish you luck. The, um, I'm going bad about Shabbos. I really did. Okay. I, I'm not... I mean, let me be clear. Okay, actually, because you said that, I had, I had some time this weekend. My husband has this little Magra Sedra thing that like has like each Pesach risen twice. That's super perfect. Yeah, but it was really tough. With I really find that super cool. I said, yeah, how much would they actually put it in twice in order to be No, but really it's because it's a tiny little thing and he just like, yeah. he like keeps it with him and he could just like... I, do yeah, I do want to say, to be clear though, because someone actually heard the audio recording of the Shia and asked me, am I saying that women have a chiyuv of Mavir Sedra? I am not saying that women have a chiyuv of Mavir Sedra. That is not what I'm saying. I'm saying that if you want to know Torah, though, like, this is a smart thing to do. Um, you could make the argument. The Mokhan of Rome believes that women are obligated in Kriya Satora. And there's a view that Mavir Sedra is a function of Kriya Satora. So you could, you could actually make that argument. Um, but, but I don't think posts can generally do. We generally assume that, that, that you're, you're exempt and it's just something you should do. Anyway, Adanim are the bases for the boards. The boards that you have vertically running you know, around, the, the, um, they're based in these uh, copper slash brass slash bronze foundations. Those are the Adanim. So Moshe puts them in place. Vayasam as Krashav, and he puts the boards in. Vayitain as Berichav, as well as the beams that run um, horizontally across. And Vayakim as Amudav, he puts up the posts. So... Moshe is putting up the, uh, the Mishkan, and that's already odd. What's odd about Moshe's role here? A little bit old. Sorry? A little old for it. Okay, what else? I think it's Batal. Well, Batal is really the coordinator of the construction. He's the subcontractor. But you had all these other people. Yeah. Why, why is Moshe doing it? Especially when, what else did Moshe do for the construction of the Mishkan? What other role did he have? Nope. Although we have the idea that he's shown... Right, so there's some discussion about that, because Hashem tells Moshe, Vizem say Amenorah. But if you look at the Pesukim, what other role does Moshe have? Nothing. (laughs) Zero. (laughs) Moshe has nothing else in the construction of the Mishkan, and suddenly at the end, we're going to have him do the grunt work. Right. It's he's not like grunt work. It's like you know, like, like when you, when you, when you do the shul, shul, like yeah, yeah, like the elders of the shul, they put the foundation when yeah. you're starting. No, they don't. They have they have an honorary shovel yeah. and they yeah. pose for a picture. <laughs> yeah, so that's what he's doing. He's doing like a flag. No, that's not what he's doing. Look what he did. He's actually he put the foundations in place. He put the he put the posts in the foundations. He took the cross beams. Yeah, right, these massive. Beams. And I've seen it's like, hey, Moshe just put it here, and he went like this. I don't think so. No. 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 And the medrash is. Bothered by this clearly, and it offers a fascinating narrative to explain what Moshe is doing. But once you once you see the Medrash, then you have a whole host of other questions. So look at source number two for the Medrash Tanhuma. How do you say that like, he was out of Kamoso and he was like the impetus behind it? Totally. You could totally do that. Watch what it says. Hey, Moshe means there are shalani shtati if we mahen b'melachas amishkan. Moshe is upset that he doesn't get to join in with creating the Mishkan. He says, after all, look at what happens, right? The, uh, the gifts are given by the Jews. They all donate the materials. The work is 
coordinated and done or coordinated really by B'tzal al-Aliyah and done by the Chachmei Leif, the people who are given special wisdom that they can know how to do the various types of crafts needed. Ulefishai and Moshe made Sarah, and because Moshe is upset, Helim HaKadosh Baruch Hu Mehem, Lo HaYucholim HaHamido, Hashem hid the the um, the way to put up the Mishkan from everybody. No one could figure out. They didn't have the Ikea manual. They didn't say A, B, C, or whatever it is. They, um, and so they don't know how to put everything together. It really is hard to understand. Like, like I mean, he told them, here's your base. And he told them, I think they're named for what they are. And he told them this to be vertical. Like, how hard okay. is it? It seems much easier than I feel. It really does. They, um, but that's what it says. It says they didn't know how to put it up. So, so, you know, they, they, they've done everything they can possibly do. They're upset. They don't know what to do. They all go to Moshe. They say, Moshe, we did everything you told us to do. We gave everything you told us to give. We did everything. We gave everything. Here it is in front of you. Did we miss anything? Did we do anything extra? Why doesn't everything fit together? See, it's all in front of you. And they showed him everything. How do you know that? The Pasuk says so. The Torah says they brought the Mishkan to Moshe and it goes on to enumerate all the different pieces. So they bring the whole thing to Moshe. And the Pasuk says Moshe saw everything they had done. So Amrullah, they said to him, didn't you tell us to do it this way? Amrullah and Hain, he said, yeah. And so too, with each thing they showed him. Amrullah, we didn't come, Lama Eno Omeid, Sinu, what did we do wrong? Sharei Karnit Staru, B'tzala, V'ahaliyah, V'chol Chach, Meilev, L'ha Amida, V'lo Ha'yicholin, because B'tzala, L'ahaliyah, and all the Chacham, are standing there trying to put up the Mishkan, and, you know, it's not working. It's just not, it's, it's not going. This actually reminds me of the, um, one of two Rashi jokes that I'm aware of. It was actually told to me by Jesse's grandfather, Jesse Kaplan's grandfather, told me this joke. They, um, it's about, um, let's see, I have to make sure to tell it properly. There's a, a young yeshiva guy who gets married, and they're going to have their first sukkahs together, and he wants to build a sukkah. So how do you build a sukkah? So he asks his rabbi, and his rabbi says, go look at this Rashi, and he gives you all the instructions. So he opens up the Gemara, reads the Gemara, reads the Rashi, says, okay, I know what I'm doing. Goes to get materials, follows all the instructions, puts it up, gust of wind comes along, collapses. Can't figure out what he did wrong. The, uh, I followed Rashi to the letter, goes back, learns the Gemara, learns the Rashi, puts it all together. Again, gust of wind comes along, blows it down. Happens a third time. He goes back to his Rebbe. He says, I don't understand. I did everything that Rashi told me. And yet it collapsed. His Rebbe says, yeah, Tosos asked that question. <laughs> so, that's not going to have as much meaning here. <laughs> but it's a good joke. The, um, so, the, but in any case, that, that, that's one Rashi joke. I can tell you the other one later. The, um, since that one went so well. So, <laughs> the other one you'll like more. But, the, but in any case, that's what happens here. The Jews go to Moshe, and they, um, and they, they say, like, why won't this thing work? By Moshe Meitzer, we're in the middle of number two. By Moshe Meitzer al Davarzeh, Moshe's upset. Until Hashem told Moshe, Lefisha Yisa Meitzer, Shalai Lacha Asiya Velochelik Mvlechas Hamishkan. You were upset, Moshe, that you didn't have a role in creating the Mishkan, right? Chayla says, Well, Shluch Hashlatam Kamoso, your Shaliach is like you, your agent is like you. Moshe, you did do it. And maybe Hashem would have been happy with that, but Moshe is not happy. He says, I didn't have a portion in the actual physical work. He says, this way everybody is going to know that it has to be Moshe to put it up, and if it's not Moshe, it's not going to stand. Hashem says, that's why they can't put it up, because I wanted you to be the one to do it. And therefore, I'm not going to write that anybody put it up other than you. Shinamar, like the Pasuk we read, by Yaakim Moshe Hamishkan. Moshe is the one who makes it stand. 
וכן הוא אומר וידבר השם על משה ביום החודש הראשון באחד החודש תקים את משכן אבל מועד אינסוף הפסק סס את השם תולד משה you're the one who's going to put up the משכן אמר משה ריבונו של עולם אין לי יודע להעמידו ומשה says I don't know how to put up the משכן like what, what do you do what goes where אמר לי זה השם סס don't worry about it עסוק בידיך ואתה מר להעמידו I want you to just do things with your hands, make it look like you're, you know, putting up the Mishkan. But when we may love it, it will stand on its own. Vani, kosei valecha, sha'atai, kimto. And I'm going to write, don't worry, Moshe put it up. Shanamar, and he quotes the Basuk. But it was, first month, second day, first of the month, who kam ha-mishkan, what the Medrash is picking up on is subtle. Or, not so subtle, but it says, who kam ha-mishkan, which means the Mishkan was put up. And then it says, vayakim Moshe et ha-mishkan, Moshe put it up. Why is it in passive voice it was put up if you're telling me that Moshe put it up? The answer is, Moshe looked like he was putting it up, but actually God did it. It just but went up. the menorah, that's okay. Yeah. 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 Yes, uh-huh. like the menorah. So now we've answered the question of what role did Moshe play, and we've offered an explanation for why Moshe is doing this role of putting everything up. The answer is he wants to do something. He wants a physical role, manual labor. Someone's honking. Or someone's car alarm. I don't know. Well, the sound is not there. No, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Sorry. I don't want to do everything. He's not even doing anything. The um, motion wants to do something. Right, so that makes everyone forget, and then he's not even really doing anything. Right. So is it dangerous? So one problem that you have here is the um, as Rizal Hanna points out, there, there's no role for him. He didn't actually do it. So. It's not mine. So. Okay. Okay. So, so one problem is, yeah. What if you're going to give Moshe a role, let him actually do it, right? The um, yeah, especially when you consider that the um, that Hashem gave everybody else their abilities. Right? We said that for all the other ones, I think I brought it actually as um, okay, one of the sources on here. Did I bring it? Um, the, um, yeah, I brought it actually in the la- at the end of the sheet, the last source, number 14. The, um, the Torah says, regarding B'Tzalel and Ahaliyah, Ulaharos nasan belibo. Right? Hashem put it in his heart. Hashem gave him the knowledge to be able to do it, him, B'tzal, and the Holy Yav, and it continues, Mileo Sam Chochmas Leib, he filled them with knowledge of the heart, with the, the information for how to do this, trained him as a craftsman to do, dot, 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 all the different work that needed to be done. So, why couldn't you give Moshe training? Teach Moshe how to build it. Why, why is Moshe doing it, but not doing it? Maybe it's like the top of being partners with Hashem and creation, that like, it had to be joint, like the same way that like Hashem and the parents make a child. That mm-hmm. be... So there, there should be a partnership. Hashem does it and Moshe does it. Okay, it's a good approach. What else? Like it had to be something very spiritual. Like it couldn't be a full understanding of Hashem and to show that it's like a one-hand, even though it's a physical dwelling. It's there has to be a spiritual aspect to it. Also could but be. But the Pesach is very specific that he put in you know, like the sockets and the beams and the boards. Yeah. So So it sounds like Moshe was putting... Well, either that or he's moving everything into place and that's what it's describing him doing. But you're right. It sounds like he's engaged. But I have a different problem well, before you get there. It's the foundation, though, right? So I feel like like what he's doing is the actual mm-hmm. beginning and the foundation. So I feel like it makes sense that Moshe, who's so spiritual, will be at the essence of the building mm-hmm. of the nation. Right. This role in particular is, suiting, is suitable for him. As opposed to the finishing, like the... Right. The creation of it. Right, although it seems like he's going to do more as, okay, the, well, as it goes through. Know. Yeah, <laughs> but, um, but the other piece of it that's difficult is why does Moshe need to do this at all? Why does Moshe have a need to engage in physical labor? Like, what, what is it about that that's going to attract a Moshe? Yeah. Oh, like the same way you have, like, the captain of an army go out into war, like, to be the first to, to lead that, right? So you have Moshe, who's the leader of 
basically it's named Charlotte, like lowliness spiritual place for... And also, but then why, why doesn't he actually do it? Why is it... And that's not because it's Captain Wong's doing. He wants to get his truth getting like in like fire. So let's just more fire than others if Percy and Charlotte were there. So, right, the answer really... And then he wants to do it himself, right? Because he wants to. The answer really could be... I mean, I want to separate out the two questions. In other words, the question of his motivation may be, you know he wants to do it for this reason and then Hashem rewards him for some completely different reason but the idea that this is Moshe's personality and it's true that the role of a Jewish king is always to be engaged and involved the king has to lead the nation out to war there, there is that sense of you, you have to you have to be involved my only problem would be then why, why is he doing this at the end because it really is the end everybody's made everything everybody's donated everything now he's just walking in in Parshas Bakude um, and, uh, and and doing this but again that wasn't really his choice Right, that wasn't really his. But like what Riesel said before, I feel like you know when a donor rebuilding the building comes and I mean by him to put up in the Zaza or something, it signifies like it's coming back like it's them. It's they're the ones who did you see that race before? Like something with elder like that well, He gave the commandments, like he gave the instructions out, didn't he? Like so he yeah. he he got up there, made the announcement, said this is what everyone's gotta do. So he sort of he, he, he was in charge. Right. Well, that's the thing. He had a role, but he wants manual labor. There's something that he wants to Maybe do. Maybe it's hard for him because the Mishka is really the role of the Kohanim and he's not the right doing anything. Oh, so he doesn't get to be a Kohen. But Levim do have a role. Levim carry all this stuff. Levim, the Gershon Kasamori, their families carried these things from place yeah, to place. Right. where they traveled, yeah. Like that's what all the mitzvahs are, and maybe he's showing the service of the Mishkan and the future based on Mikdash. It's all physical, but really the physical is the spiritual. Mm-hmm. Could be. These are all valid and valuable answers. I don't think any of these are wrong, and and all of these have been you know offered as you know debris at one time or another. They, uh, don't get me wrong. They, um, I think you're I think you're right. I think there are, there are other elements of this though, and there there are additional concepts which which uh, are important to grasp. So I'm going to add to what's being said without disagreeing with it. But also, why did the mentor have to be so fanciful? Like, why did they have to come up with this whole like, convoluted story of what happened? Like, why, why is it so bothersome the way it is? Well, what bothers you when it is convoluted? That it's, that it's, that it's, that it's, that it's just, just like this is element, that it's not natural, right? Because it's trying to answer a couple questions. First, why is Moshe doing it? Because he wasn't meant to. Why does it say who comes? Right. See, part of, this is, part of this is Midrashic style in the sense that Midrash Tanchuma is different from, let's say, we spent a lot of time in the earlier parts of, of Chumash Mos, reading Mechilta, Halachic Medrash. Mechilta is very terse. One sentence, two sentences, and you're done. Um, Medrash Rabbah is more wordy, story-oriented in general. The, um, the, it certainly draws on more of Tanakh than Mechilta does. Medrash Tanchuma is canonized later, and is much more verbose. Because really, you could have said this medrash in two sentences. And if this medrash had appeared in Medrash Rabbah, it would have been in two sentences. The medrash would have been bothered by, why is Moshe doing this, and why does it say by Yaakim versus Hukam? It may have told you that it's bothered by that, or it may not, and just expected you to understand it, and it would have said to you, Moshe puts up the Mishkan, he was upset until now, God left it out of what the people could do, and said, Moshe, you're going to pretend to do it, and I'm going to finish it. And that's what all, all it would have said. But Medrash Tanchuma is more verbose. That's just the way it's written. So you get this. this whole after thought of, like, you're going to pretend, and then it's really going to be done by me. Like an after thought, like, oh, because you're upset. So we'll, well, it's a pasuk which said, who come instead of Hayak and Moshe. Right. That's really what they're what they're picking up. On. So let's let's offer a couple of, uh, of possibilities. First, what Moshe really wants, I would suggest first, is a role in terms of manual labor. Physical work has value, and this goes back to something we said last week when we talked about the mirrors and the uh, and the kior, right? And Moshe's horror at uh, incorporating something so physical in the uh, in the Mishkan. Moshe lives in a less material realm. He's the one who goes up Har Sinai, spends 40 days there, doesn't eat, doesn't drink. You know, that, that's, that's who we're talking about. He's the one who separates from his family. Moshe is not, um, he, he's not someone who engages in the physical in general. I brought you a Gemara in source number three. I referenced it last week, but didn't have it on the sheet, about him and B'Tzalel and the order of creation of things for the Mishkan. The Gemara says, B'Tzalel al Shem Chochma Sonikra. B'Tzalel was named for his wisdom. What do you mean? 
Bishash Amalak Hashbrochu Lemoshe, Lech Amor Lola Bitzalei Al Haseli Mishkan Aron Bekilim. When Hashem said to Moshe, Go tell Bitzalel, make a Mishkan, make an Aron, make the implements, in that order. Halach Moshe, Bahafach, Moshe reversed it. Bahamarlo, he said to Bitzalel, as you find in the Chumash, Asay Aron Bekilim Mishkan, make an Aron, make Kalim, make a Mishkan. Amarlo, he said to him, Moshe Rabbeinu, Min hakol shel olam, Adam bone bayis, Ve'achakach machnes l'sel chokelim. He says, Moshe, the way the world works is that you build a house, and then you put the items inside. Ve'ata omer asay li aron v'kelim mishkan. You're telling me make the aron, make the kelim, make the mishkan. After kelim shani osel, hechanach nisim. Where exactly am I going to put all the things I made? Right? You're telling me I should make an aron and just leave it there? I mean, it doesn't rain in the midbar. Fine. And the man, I guess, will just fall around it, so you don't have to worry about the man falling on it. But it's not right to just make an aron and leave it in the middle of nowhere. So Shema Kach Amar Lachagadish Baruch Hu Betzal says to Moshe, "Could it be that God said the following? I say Mishkan Aron Bekelim, make the Mishkan first. Mishkan. When I say make the Mishkan, let me just make sure that's clear to people. The Mishkan itself. When I say the Mishkan, what we mean is the boards that went around it, as well as." the cover that went on top of it, the hides, as well as the woven cover that, that went on top of it. That's what we mean when we say um, Mishkan. So he says, that's where, um, that's where it should be. Mishkan first, then Aaron and Kalim. Omar lo, to which Moshe said, oh, huh, that makes sense. Shema b'tzel kel ha'isa v'yadata. Maybe you were in the shadow of God, and therefore you knew. Tzel kel b'tzel that's the that's the idea. Now, this Gemara is what might be called. I'm trying to think of a nice way to say this. Hmm. Okay, you can't use the word wrong. That's not allowed in this sentence. But the problem is, when did they put up the Mishkan? We know because we just read it. Yeah. No. The coup day after everything was made. Right. They, didn't. They, didn't. they didn't do it the way the Gemara says. The Gemara says, he says they put up the Mishkan and then we'll have a place in order to put the Kalim when we make them. But that's not what they did. They brought everything to Moshe all together. So I don't really follow what's going on in this story. I, I don't, there's some, something is wrong here. I just don't know what and it also is. also, it's like the Paul's telling Moshe, like, you heard that. Well, that's the other piece of it that's really difficult to grasp. Take a look at source number four. The Maharal tries to smooth off that rough edge on this uh, on this Gemara. Yeah, go ahead. Um, was inside the it was completely dark, was like all covered. Well, yeah, no. And so it was just burning fire inside like a tent. <laughs> Made of no, <laughs> right, so the answer the answer is that you have to have some system for venting whatever fume you have from the uh, from from the menorah as well as other means of illumination that may have been present. Meaning it wasn't just the menorah. The Gemara in Shabbos, like Chavala or so, asks, um, has, has Hashem say to the Jews, you should know the menorah is not for me. The menorah is for you. Right. God doesn't need the menorah. Right? After all, the Jews travel by a pillar of fire that Hashem provides. So God doesn't need the illumination. It's you. When the menorah is for your, for the sake of your honor, that it's there. And that fits the wording when the Torah introduces the, uh, the mitzvah of menorah. Was, was it a very high ceiling? So, yes. What, what all the things from the birds you're, of the... You're the crush, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. 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 Where'd that go? Yeah. I always thought yeah. that was done with yeah. open. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And when it rains, no, no, it's not. The the Krashim. The Krashim are ten of us tall. The Krashim are ten of us tall. You're talking about the Yeah. It's a high. It's a high ceiling. They were shorter in those days. They had to walk on that ramp. Sorry. They walked hard, like inside. They went up. So there's a ramp for the Mizbeah, but it's not that tall in Mizbeah. What about all the view and the burning of the they probably stank in there all the blood of these yeah, rituals Okay, so we are really going to move on here. Not because it's not an interesting question, but because I don't have a better answer. They, um, Did they get wet? Did they have to wait for the rain. Oh, rain. What rain? You're in the midbar. I don't think it followed the laws of natural. And the, wait, hang on. Shh. 
back up. The Mishkan in Israel is a different structure. The Mishkan, once they establish a Mishkan in Shiloh, it's actually a different structure. It doesn't follow all the rules of the Mishkan they've been traveling with in the Midbar. Uh, for example, it has stone walls instead of having a uh, instead of having these uh, these boards. Well, the Mishkan they build in Israel is not the same structure that they used in the. Uh, and is it not covered? Is open? So you do have open areas in the base of Mikdash. We don't get a description of much in terms of the Mishkan itself, but I would have to assume that you have something open. I mean, the Israelis did this, so there must have been a way to do it. I just don't have the details on, on what was going on. But take a look at the Maharal, who tries to explain how B'Tzalel is going to correct Moshe. He says... He says, you could say that Moshe puts the Kalim, the implements, first, because after all, they are more important than the Mishkan. They have a higher status. You start with the essence. But when you're dealing with practicalities, doing things, you should make the Mishkan first. Because that is where you protect all these implements. And therefore, B'Tzalel, who's in charge of doing things, gets the knowledge that the Mishkan should be done first. Moshe is in charge of the intellect of study. Mishkan knew the design of the Mishkan. And that was the study that informed him when he instructed everybody. So he gives the instructions based on what's more important. But B'Tzalel says, that's fine. When I talk to the contractors, you know, they're making it in a different way. Because it doesn't make sense your way. The, uh, but I said it nicer. So that's, you know, that's our general picture of Moshe, is that Moshe is the intellect, and B'Tzalel is the one who's going to be hands-on, he's going to do things. But that just pushes the question. So why, why does Moshe want to engage in manual labor? Why is he moving out of his zone? But there, there's a lot to be said for the value of physical exertion, and I want to present it on four levels. First of all, the idea, very simply and straightforwardly, um, I thought I'd brought a source for it, on, but I'm looking at my notes and I don't see one, so I'll just say it outside of that. And that's that it's, it's like a car run. Physical strength is finite and exhaustible, right? I mean, you could argue that people get tired also of thinking, right? Thinking drains your blood sugar levels. This is true. Um, nonetheless, physical strength is considered to be like you do the work and then you're exhausted and wiped out. You've given God something. And so maybe that's what Moshe wants. He wants the feeling that he did something. Um, That's his gift to Hashem. One possibility. Second possibility is that it's about personal growth. Take a look at number five, please, from the B'nai Machshavatot, or Klinimus Kalman Shapiro, the Piazetzner. He writes, He says, when you serve Hashem with your mind, it has to start from below and work its way upward. What does that mean? First you purify your body, and then your mind will be influenced by that to be purified and strengthened. You don't start with your mind first. You have to have discipline in relation to the material. And that's important for him. B'nei Mach is his guide for creating a community of people dedicated to the service of Hashem. It's fantastic. It's really important reading. I highly recommend it. Um, in, it's published, I think, in the beginning of some editions of Eish Kodesh. I think they may have B'nei Mach So when you're done with Madras Sedra, you can you know, look at that also. But, um, but the, the idea here is that physical exertion builds discipline. And maybe that's what Moshe wants. Maybe that's what he is looking for. Possibility. Like the idea of now it's an additional, right? We'll do it, and then it becomes part of it, and then you'll... That's interesting. I haven't thought about it that way, but yes. The Nase influencing the Nishma. Good. Um, Third possibility is part of proximity to Hashem. Because the very first thing we know about Hashem in the Torah is that God is a... Creator. Right? That's the first thing we know about Hashem in the Torah. So much so, the Nachash says to Chava, eat from the fruit, and v'yisem kelokim. You will be like God. And Rashi comments, source number six, what does that mean? 
Yotzrei Olamot. You will be creators of worlds. I feel like I must have mentioned this idea at one point here, that um, that that fits the punishments they get. Why does eating from the tree make you a creator? Because the snake is trying to get them to eat from the tree, so he promises them what they want. Whether it really can do that or not, whether there's any connection between da tovara and actually being a creator of worlds, is fodder for many different to Torah. But it could just be the snake is just trying to tempt them into, into eating it. But it fits the punishments they get. Hashem says to them, you want to create worlds? You will. But not get rich quick, you know? You, uh, you ate from a fruit, and now you're, um, you're able to, to do that. So, Adam, you're going to bring life into the world from the ground. But it's not going to be easy. You're going to sweat. You're going to plant one thing and something else is going to come out. You're going to have to deal with thorns and nettles and all of that. And Chava, you're going to bring life from your body. But also, it's going to be pregnancy. It's going to be labor. It's going to be all of those things. It's you want it to be a creator of worlds, and you will be. But you're going to have to work at it in order to, uh, in order to get it. That's the, um, that's the payoff. But the point that I'm bringing you here for is simply that Hashem is a creator. That's what it's about. So much so that when the Torah says that Hashem invests them with the ability to create, take a look at source number 7, Ramban says Kol ish hasher libo, all those whose hearts elevated them. It's talking about the craftsmen who did the work. The Torah doesn't say those who gave the materials that they also had their hearts elevated. It just says they were generous. When the text says those whose hearts elevated them to draw near to do the work, because none of them had training. When they were slaves in Egypt, they weren't making gold statues. That wasn't, that wasn't their job. They were making bricks. So none of them come into the Midbar with the means of weaving and spinning and forming and sculpting. There was no one there who had any training whatsoever. And yet they found in their heart, I know how to do this. And that person was then elevated and came before Moshe and said, I can do this. The point being, what Ramban is saying, is that Hashem makes them creators. Hashem invests them with creativity. Which leads to a salvation state. How Hashem decide who to give that kind of chachma to? Good question. You could suggest, based on the psukim, those who really had a desire. That's what it sounds like. It sounds like there are people who want to, and Hashem completes it for them. But Rav Soloveitchik is famous for saying that creativity is a way to emulate Hashem. In his view, and I brought you here the, uh, the translation from Halachic Man, from Professor Kaplan, who did the classic translation, he says the scriptural portion of the creation narrative is a legal portion, meaning when you read Bereshus, you're not reading a story. You're reading halacha. How is that? What does that mean? I read Bereshus Barla Kim, I'm reading halacha. He says, it's a legal portion in which are to be found basic, everlasting halachic principles. If the Torah then chose to relate to man the tale of creation, we may clearly derive one law from this manner of procedure, that man is obligated to engage in creation and the renewal of the cosmos. When we are taught to emulate Hashem, Start from the beginning of the Torah, where Hashem creates, and you should be creative as well. That's the idea of Allah, the Bidrachav, you are, you are imitating Hashem. That's so, the Apostle Shabbos and the Mishnah What do you mean? That you should rest from creating, and creating were Malachos. Yeah. So well, how does that connect here? I'm just saying that Shabbos is like a resting from creating. Right. But why should I refrain Dafka from those acts that Hashem inspired me to do to emulate Him? Like, I would think those are the ones I should continue. If you're emulating Hashem, then it's Hashem halted, so you halt. Okay, good. Actually, that was my shear from Midrash at Yom Rishon a few weeks ago, was on this topic of why it is that, what, as I put it there, what makes a Mishkan breaks a Shabbos. The, um, yeah, which um, I think there's a lot to be said, but that, that's certainly a good uh, idea with it, and it's going to take me where I'm going next, so it's even more helpful. The, um, what we have so far are three levels to why Moshe would want to exert a 
carbon, right? It's his gift to God of his exhaustible resource. It's for his own personal growth. It's for proximity to Hashem. Hashem is a creator and I am going to create. But I think there's another element, which is when you do physical labor, when you have that as a skill, when you have that as an option, it makes the spiritual labor more valuable, more meaningful. In other words, to put it differently, um, when you have somebody who decides that they're going to learn in Kolo or become a teacher or a rabbi or whatever it is because that's the only thing they know how to do, so what else were they going to do, right? They needed to do something, so fine, they did it. When you have somebody who had training to do something else or talent to do something else, and they said, you know, I want to devote myself to this, that's a choice that they're making to not do X but instead do Y, that's more meaningful. That's what I'm proposing here. The, um, and I think that's what, you know, what, what Moshe is doing here with physical labor makes his spiritual work, makes his communication with Hashem much more valuable. We find that regarding Shabbos. I'm not going to ask you what the common denominator is in number nine between all of those psukim that I just quoted. The... Um, but I will note for you source number 10 because that will tell you Ibn Ezra writes when the Torah says Sheshes yamim ta'avod right six days you shall work that's what appears in all of those psukim eight times in the Torah with slight variations in wording, the Torah says, six days you shall work, and then you stop on Shabbos. So Ibn Ezra gives it the classic read, which is, it's not a mitzvah, you have to work for six days, do malach for six days, and then stop for Shabbos. He believes that it's rishus, and that's a standard take. But take a look at Sarsim no, number 11. Sound like rishus at all. It yeah. doesn't. No, no. If the Torah says eight different times, you shall do work, you have to wonder. So take a look at number 11. Sorry? If you're a Vilna Gaon, right? The Vilna Gaon says there is a mitzvah of eating matzah each day of Pesach. Tamidim of the Gura say Allah he loves matzah. But we hold that you don't have to. We hold you don't. Because you have to, we don't have to. Correct. It just means if you're going to eat a bread, if you're going to eat a grain thing, it's going to be matzah. Right, that's why we usually take it, and that's why Ibn Ezra takes this, and I can't disagree with him as a matter of psaq. You couldn't tell somebody that there's a 614th mitzvah that is go get a job. They like to sometimes. But, um, but take a look at source number 11. Well, it might not be it's Well, it's, it's malacha. It's malacha, right? It's a learning to learn malacha. Good. Hang on with that question. Take a look at number 11 first. Take a look at number 11 first, really. The Shesh um, Yamim Tavod. Rebbe Omer. Rebbe Reuda said, Hare Zu Gezerah Acheres. He says that's a separate instruction, meaning separate from the mitzvah of Shabbos is a mitzvah of work for six days. Shekeshem Shenistavu Yisrael on mitzvah Zaseshel. Shabbos Ka Nitzavu Al Hamalacha. Just like we were commanded, stop for Shabbos. We were commanded to do malacha. And then you get these three other statements. Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah Omer, Gedola malacha, Shalosh Shartsa Shtina bi Yisrael, Ad Sha'asu malacha. Rabbi Lezer ben Azariah says, Malacha is so great, physical labor is so great, and the Shekhinah was not manifest on B'nai Yisrael until they did Malacha. The Asuli Mikdash, make a Mikdash for me, and then Vishachanti Besocham. Then I will dwell in their midst. Rabbi Akiva Omer Gedola Malacha, Sharei Nen Ashav Aprutam in a Hektish, maybe Me'ila Bechomsha, or maybe Asham Beshtei Slaim. But Paul and Shayos in the Hektish, Nolan Scharan, Mitchum Asalishka. Rabbi Akiva says, you know, if somebody benefited inappropriately from the property of the Beis Hamikdash, they had to bring a carbon. They had to pay what they got and extra back. But the workers do the work for the Mishkan and they get paid from Hektish, from sacred items. So you see the value of Malacha, that it enables them to get, to benefit from that which normally comes at a high cost. And then finally, Rabbi Shimon Omer Gedola Malacha, Shafilu Kohen Gadol Nechas Biyom Akipur Shalom Shaz Avoda Chayav Misa. Rabbi Shimon looked, says, look, says the Kodesh Kadashim, Holy of Holies, no one gets to go in there. Only the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur with a special service, then he gets to go in, and otherwise, Misa. 
and and uh, and yet Bishas Avoda, when they're working on the Kodesh Kadashim, not only can anybody go in to do the work, but even he holds a tame, someone who's impure, can go into the Kodesh Kadashim to do work. A Balmum, a person who's blind, is allowed to go in to uh, to do work. Sorry. Dina. What work are you talking about? Repairs. If repairs needed to be done in the Kodesh Kadashim, they would put them in and they would do the work. So it's only yeah, that the whole that now, you yeah. can't do. Really? It's only, well, no, no other presence is allowed there. You can't go in some, you, you know, but unless, you, unless they said cleaning was needed in order to take care of it, then you could. But their point is, this is of, of special value. Is this, this highlights the value of physical labor. Yeah. Like, if you don't have any physical labor, then really, like, what's Shabbos? Right. There's no resting from anything. You're Correct. Like so this was something... <laughs> This was something developed by Rabbi Menachem Mendel Kasher. He developed this idea quite a bit in the 20th volume of his Torah Shlema. He talks about that a lot. And what he suggests is also seen in this Medrash Shabbos Rabbi Nassim that I brought you in number 12, is that your dafk is supposed to do Malacha on Friday to show that resting on Shabbos is special. Take a look at number 12. He says... Ehovis Hamalacha, Mishnah Pirkayavo says you're supposed to love Malacha. Chayav Adam Lios Oevis Hamalacha Baosik Bimalacha. One must love Malacha and involve himself in it. And look at this. Rahayya Rabbi Liazar Omer. Rabbi Liazar used to say, Gedola hi Malacha, Shakashem Shinitstava Yisrael, Allah Shabbos, Kach Nitstava Allah Malacha. Just like we were told to keep Shabbos, we were also told to do Malacha, like that Pasuk. Rabbi Liazar Omer Gedola hi Malacha, Shakola Goza, Shaver Shava Pruta, Sarah Lelech Achra, Afilu Madai. Paul Shayos in Balabayas, because Sabah is Afilu Achas, Mania, Fedina, or Ochaveno Bo. She says, You know? Rabbi Liazar says, Malacha is so great that normally you take anything from somebody else, you're punished, you have to pay for it, and you have to follow the guy to the ends of the earth in order to track him down and pay for it. Whereas, if you're a worker, and you're working, let's say, with Kosovos, with, uh, with dates, the, um, you're allowed to eat from them as you're working. The Torah says explicitly, you're, the worker in the field is allowed to eat from whatever he's working on. He's not allowed to put it away in his bag to take home, but he's allowed to eat while he's working, because we value Malacha. Vaodai Rebbe Omer, and Rebbe also said, Gedola hi Malacha shafil adam chatzer ogina charevim, yelech miyazov bahem kadeshe asuf Malacha. Rebbe says, you know what? Even if you have some ruined yard or garden, and you don't need to go there, you don't need to be involved, you should do it, just to involve yourself in physical work. And the last part is the best. Maisa Rabbi Yoshia. Story with Rabbi Yoshia, one of the Tanoim. Shahaya Mefana es Kalev Me'erev Shabbos im Chashecha, Bibayazel Abayazel, Mizabiyazel Azabiyazel. Rabbi Yoshia had a practice that on Friday afternoon, as it's getting dark, Shabbos is starting, this will resonate, I suspect, with a lot of people, he was moving stuff from one house to one to another house, from one part of the house to another house. Now, he wasn't relaxed as Shabbos was coming in. He's running around as Shabbos is, uh, is coming in. Omrulo, his student, said to him, Rebbe, our master, Lama Ta'osaka, why are you doing this? It's not like, it wasn't even work. He wasn't doing something practical. He was just running around. So Amr, he said to them, Kedesh Tavar Aleinu Shabbos, so that Shabbos will come upon us. Shnemar Shabbos Vayinavash. Hashem halted and rested. So that's the practice in my household, is that down to the wire, we're doing it because God did it and Rabbi Yoshia did it. So there's my basis. Anybody bothers you about it? Yes. I was dropping No, but the, now, like, whenever something happens, they want to add on to Shabbos, start Shabbos earlier. So right. It goes against it. No, it doesn't. Because starting Shabbos earlier is fine, but oh, work until that moment. Moment when you started. I mean, look, the, you know, the, the, um, the always those beautiful stories of people that were sitting and oh, laughing. Yeah, 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 yes, yes, there are such stories. The, um, I believe that such people exist. Now, the, uh, but maybe they could work towards. Like someone actually told you, your house should be calm on Friday. Yes, people, people always say that. Set your people for you the know, night. I'll, I'll never forget. forget. I don't think that calm. You could still be working in a calm um, state. It doesn't need to be right. Like That's true. Do you, know, do you know the veils? Are we not sure to borrow the veil? The veils? Yeah. Some, you know, yeah. Okay, so, so um, at the bayou, between Rabbi Tal and Rabbi Karab, and Rabbi Veil was the interim rabbi. And I remember vividly him speaking at one point and talking about Fridays, and he said that he and his wife had a practice of taking a nap on Friday. I can't tell you how jealous 
<laughs> There's a whole movement that was started by some, some, somebody somewhere, which is like taking over that people are. It's called like something they finished by Chatos on Friday. I mean, there is a halacha that you're not supposed to do malacha on Friday afternoon. Let's be clear. Other than that which is needed for Shabbos, you're supposed to finish your malacha. You're not supposed to do malacha from a certain point on Friday afternoon. It's, it's basically two and a half at the last two and a half hours of the day. Yeah. Other than what's needed to prepare Shabbos. Sorry. It's turning on the hot water for Shabbos. That's okay because it's your shower for Shabbos. So, so what are you not allowed to be doing? So it means that if I'm preparing shiurim on Friday afternoon, it means I have to stop two and a half hours before Shabbos, close the computer, and get involved in cleaning the house and laundry and whatever else needs still to be done. So that means that when Shabbos comes in at four o'clock, like everyone needs to be leaving work at. No, not a halacha. That only applies to you. Sorry, I didn't hear that question. It only applies to you for someone who wants to be here for Shabbos. They would be allowed to be in the last. Yes, yes. That's true. It's not their business. That's true. The point is that, that the focus really should be on Shabbos in those last couple of hours. It shouldn't be on all the other stuff. Yes, I know. I, I think I can safely say I know better than most how hard it is to do this. At the same time, I, um, I don't want people to come away from what we're seeing here and say, oh, so it's really good. I can keep on doing my work up until the last moment, and I have a foundation for doing so. But what we are seeing here is the idea that Shabbos becomes more meaningful Absolutely. if you're yeah. stopping Malacha. Well, the more work you do, the more you love Shabbos. Exactly. Yes. No, it's, it's, you don't have an appreciation of Shabbos when you're a kid. The, uh, it's only once you have like real responsibilities during the week, and then Friday night, you just say to yourself, there's nothing I can do about it, so just put it out of my mind. I remember uh, when I was a... I, I went from Smicha straight into my first shul. And I remember vividly one of my first Friday nights during the Chadodi, thinking, wow, this is great. <laughs> like, all these things that are in my head on Friday that I can't, you know, that now I just, there's nothing I can do about it. Just leave it be. Forget about it. And, yeah, that was a great, I had not understood until then. But my Kasher applies this on a completely different front. You know, the, there's a classic debate about what to do about the international date line in Halacha. If a person goes to Hawaii, a person goes to Japan, what's the, um, you know, when do they keep Shabbos? And there are those who argue you keep two days. If you go there from a place where this day should be Shabbos, but where they are, they're observing a different day, then you actually keep two days. Rabbi Kasher said you can't, because you've gotten rid of Sheisha Siyamim Tavod. You've eliminated the six days. There are other reasons not to do it. But um, that was an interesting argument that he, that he made. So applying this to, to our discussion, maybe Moshe wants to engage in Malacha because that makes all the other spiritual things that he's doing, makes them more valuable. It makes it more meaningful. He communicates with Hashem because he has this physical work as well. And now he's holding his physical and he's going to go do his spiritual. That's all one idea. I have two other things that I want to make sure to get to, and I see that we're, we're running low on time, but as you can see from the source sheet, these are, um, they, there's time to handle these, the other parts. I have a second idea for what Moshe wanted here, and it's not about the work. The language in that Medrash Tanchuma was interesting. If you go back to the beginning of, the, uh, of source number two, Paya Moshe made fair, Moshe was upset, not necessarily that he didn't build the Mishkan, but that he didn't join with everybody else. Now, it was already suggested, I think it might have been Dasi, who said that you know, he's supposed to lead with everybody, he's supposed to be engaged with everybody, and so there's that element of it, but I think it's more than that. There are few people in Tanakh who are more isolated than Moshe Rabbeinu. Right? He grows up in Paro's palace, away from everybody. Um, as an adolescent, or he's, he's 13, he's 20, however old he is, he flees to Midian, where he marries Tsipora, a woman from a family who are pariahs in Midian. Right? They're having trouble there. They're getting chased away by the well, and so on. And then Moshe returns from Midian to a nation that doesn't really want him. Right? They, you know, they, when he goes to Paro, and Paro says, I'm going to double the workload, the people say, go back to Midian. We don't, we, we don't need you here. You're making things worse, not better. Leave us to our slavery, right? And then, you know, Matan Torah, you think is going to be Moshe's chance to sort of rejoin the nation. And he'll teach them, and you know, they'll get to know them, they'll get to know him. But he comes down from Harsinai, and he discovers the Egel, 
right? He has the levy to kill the people who are involved in the Egel. And then he's distanced from everybody all over again, because he has to be a judge, he has to order the execution, but he's also a physical outsider. Take a look at source number 13. The first line in there. Moshe takes his tent, and he moves it outside of the camp. He's far away from the camp. And he calls it the Ahal Moed. And anybody who seeks God goes out to the camp. Moshe is physically away from everybody else. He even has to wear a veil. Right? There's a veil that he has to wear to cover his face because the people cannot uh, cannot endure his radiance. The uh, when he when he teaches them, sorry. Oh, how much does it? Masve, right? Ki Karan or Pnei Moshe. That's the reason because of the radiance, not horns. The um, but yes, it's the end of Parshas Kisisa. The um, that Moshe wears a uh, a, a veil. Here it makes it sound like the Olam is Moshe's personal thing. It does. There's a lot of there's a lack of clarity as to that. I'm going to come back to it in a moment. Um, he's even distant from his family, right? He separates from from Tzipora. But the Mishkan, building the Mishkan, provides a way for Moshe to join the people. There, in his first Ohel Moed, which is Moshe's tent, that's the first line in number 13, so it's outside the camp. But now Moshe has a second Ohel Moed, which is the Mishkan. And where is the Mishkan located? In the middle. In the middle of the camp. All the Shvatim are camped around it. You take a look at the second line in number 13. The cloud covers the Ohel Moed. This is the second Ohel Moed. Hashem's honor fills the Mishkan. And Moshe can't go in right away because the cloud is on it. That's the place where people go in order to commune with Hashem, and that is in the middle of the camp, and so Moshe is back in. And maybe that's what Moshe is looking for here. He wants not just to be involved in the physical labor for all the benefits that that brings, um, but he wants the opportunity to join the people in their Kedusha. They are all building a Mishkan, and Moshe wants to be a part of that process. But he doesn't really get that. Right, he never really gets it. That's it. I mean, next week, <laughs> next week, this is Rosh Hashanah. So uh, next Thursday, God willing, is Moshe's yard site. The uh, that's one of the hallmarks of Moshe is that for as wonderful as he is, he is, he remains an outsider. The, um, like even in the Mishkan, he doesn't go and work with them. He, they all don't know what they're doing, and then Moshe comes by himself. Right. True. Will I ask a question or are you about the Sorry. Will I ask a question or not? Okay, well, well, let, me let me finish the verse, because, yeah, cause, yeah. The, um, the last part here. Why doesn't Hashem let Moshe do this? We already read number 14 in the beginning, right? Hashem invests others with their abilities. He gives Bitzal all the means. He gives all the other means. Why doesn't Hashem do that for Moshe, right? And if Hashem wants to have Moshe do the concluding job, the, um, you know, he takes it away from Moshe. Does Moshe just pretend to do it? Like, what does that even, what does that even mean? He didn't give Moshe the ability in the beginning. And now at the end, he has Moshe pretend. Not to mention, wouldn't it have been better for the Mishkan to actually be built by Moshe? So you could make that suggestion. They say for Moshe entering Eretz Yisrael that he can't go in. That's what you're referring to. Right? Yeah, if he goes in, he'll be the way to and God won't destroy it. Could be. Yeah. That's also that's our thing, like it was really for them. They were the ones who needed it. They're the ones who needed it. Moshe doesn't need it. Yeah. I mean, could think that maybe. Yeah, yeah it's an interesting are, possibility. Because yeah. like, why didn't Hashem give him the chutzpah? Why just do like? Yeah. Because he's the ultimate issue that the world is really just a very spiritual one, and everything is for Hashem. It's mm-hmm. the issue that even like when we think we're doing something, it's not really up to Hashem. He's could be. Exactly you could right? definitely give that answer. So Moshe is allowed to, but not allowed to, in order to show there's a barrier. Could be. I want to float an idea, which I think is important in many other contexts, and we're running out of time, so I'm going to float the idea. The, um, even though these other answers are good, but I think Kali Yisrael needs multiple types of leaders. It's not good for us to have Moshe be B'Tzalel. Right? You end up with a situation in which you're, you know, if Moshe is the only one entrusted with building the Mishkan, we're never going to trust a leader like Betzalel because he's not Moshe. Right? Somebody who can do the physical things. Someone who could run this sort of uh, a Mishkan campaign. Betzalel Ahaliyah, anybody who's gifted in what Maharal calls the Olam HaAsiyah, the world of doing, we're going to look at them and say, yeah, but you're not Moshe. And, that, and I don't just mean you're not Moshe, because no one's Moshe. But you don't excel as a spiritual leader, so therefore you can't be qualified 
to, to lead us physically. It's like you have the hierarchy of, of Dayanim, of judges, right? If Moshe is the way he is in the beginning of Parashat Yisro, the only judge who can manage all the cases of the Jews, and all the Jews have to stand there online to be heard by Moshe, that's a disaster. Because every time you need a Dayan in the future, it's always going to be, well, he's not Moshe. I can only be judged by Moshe. And even again, even if you'll say, well, no one's Moshe, I can only be judged by the greatest judge of the generation. I'll never go to anybody else. You need to establish a hierarchy of others in order that people should understand you don't have to be Moshe. There are different models of leadership and there are different levels of leaders. And if you're going to demand that, the leader has to be a Moshe. It, it, it's just going to be a disaster. That doesn't work. And you can see it in Tanakh. Best example may be Ezra and Nehemiah in the beginning of the second base Hamikdash. Both leaders, simultaneous, they, there's a lot of debate among historians who was there first, not important for right now. We find them together at the end of Sefer Nehemiah. But Ezra is a teacher of halacha. He's an enforcer of halacha. He creates takanos, enactments. He leads public gatherings to promote Torah. But Nehemiah is the one who harnesses the population to build the wall of Yerushalayim. He creates a system of civil defense for the city, revolutionizes the economy, he compels 10% of the population to move to Yerushalayim. That's Nehemiah. They're two different people. If your only leadership model is assigned to the man of God, the people will never accept Nehemiah. They'll love Ezra. Ezra in the Gemara is seen as a sort of reincarnation of sorts of Moshe. He also has a reincarnation of Ahara and a few Baalachida, but that's a whole other discussion. The, um, but, but Ezra is, is the new Moshe. So number one, that places an unfair burden on Ezra. But also, no one will ever accept Nehemiah. You need others. It's not enough to just have a, uh, a Moshe. And so maybe that's the deal. Hashem starts off the construction with Bitzalel, with Ahaliyah and the people. And Moshe gets a role because he demands it. He's not happy being left out of it. But Hashem says, I don't want you doing this. I want others doing this. So you'll have a show of doing it, but the Torah itself is going to say, It wasn't really Moshe putting it up. It was done on his behalf so that people will understand that there are these different realms. And the one who does this, does that. The one who does that, doesn't do this. You know, that, that, kind, of, that, that kind of idea. I like that idea. Uh, yeah. Take it or leave it, but I like it. Thank you. So, if anyone wants to ask the questions that we're going to ask, we still have a minute or two. Yeah, what do you think about Olam Oli? There's two Olam Yes. And Olam Oli is before the Mishnah? Yes. That's, I mean, that's pretty clear in the Hamash. I know, I never thought about it. Yeah. There are also two Aron notes, but that's a separate problem. You have an Aron when Moshe comes down from Harsina with the Luchas the second time. That's in the Aron? Yeah.